We are live. Welcome back to chapter seven of general chemistry. This is thermodynamics. It's not going to be fun. It's going to be rather boring, but it's a chapter that I really love because in undergrad, I was given a holistic understanding of thermodynamics that I'd never been given before. Even though it's something that I've been covering since I was maybe 15 years old, I didn't really learn it until my fourth year encountering it, which is unbelievable. That will happen very often, right? For all the people watching back home, thank you so much for keeping up. And be sure to check down in the description for the link to all of our recorded lectures and the link to the drive folder that contains my study guide, a sign-up sheet for our email list, and my notes, which I'm uploading tonight. Um, so let's talk about thermochemistry. So first, we need to talk about systems, right? So a system is basically a, like matter that's being observed. That's the way that the book describes it. Right? And then you have a surrounding environment, right? So you have the system, all the stuff in the system that you're, that you're staring at, and you want to look at what's going on. And you have everything else around it. And now the system can communicate with its environment a little. It can communicate with its environment a lot. Or it might not communicate with its environment at all. Think of people. You have very sociable people, kind of sociable people. And you have people who never speak to anyone. Right? OK. So what are the different types of systems? Well, we have an isolated system. So an isolated system does not communicate at all with its environment. So no, god damn it. No heat slash energy transfer with environment. nor matter. So you can't ha transfer heat. You can't transfer energy. You can't transfer matter. You can't do shit, right? The, close, the, the isolated system is locked in a box and then put inside of the bottom of the fucking treasury, and then the sun exploded and destroyed everything around it, right? It can't do anything. The closed system is different. It can exchange or transfer heat and work, but not matter. So this is a lot of chemical reactions, right? If you put a chemical reaction inside of a box, right, and that box expresses heat and sends heat out of the atmosphere, but it's not sending any of the particles or anything out like that, that is a closed system. And that means an open system, which I'm not going to write down because I want to save time, can exchange both energy in the form of heat and work, as well as matter. How does that work? You guys ever boiled tea before and seen the water vapor exploding out of the kettle of tea? That's molecules of what? That's matter leaving the teapot, right? And then we have something known as a process. And a process is a change in one or more of the system's properties. So now knowing that information, we can step and dip our little toes into the world of thermodynamics. So let's talk about thermodynamics. Thermodynamics is a lot more physics than it is chemistry. But the easiest way to describe it is using chemical terms, which is why I think it comes up a lot more in chemistry than it does in intro level physics. But once you start talking about thermodynamics and physics, you know you're screwed, because it's really confusing. So the first law of thermodynamics states that the change in the internal energy of a system, or delta U, equals Q minus W. What is delta U? It's the change in internal energy 
of a system. Q is the heat added. And W is the work done by the system. Is that for me? <laughs> I am horrible at the beginning of thermodynamics. So what we're going to do is we're going to glaze over some of the things, but I urge you to look back in the book and look at the diagrams that describe some of these different processes. We have isothermal processes, adiabatic processes, isobaric processes, and isovolumetric processes. We will go through what all of those means, what all those mean. First, we have an isothermal process. An isothermal process, what, what do you think it means? What does iso mean? Same. Thermal means temperature, right? So it's a process that a system undergoes at constant temperature. Temperature is held constant, right? So this implies that the internal energy, because what is temperature except a measure of kinetic energy? The internal energy of the system is held constant throughout the process, right? As the process is undergoing, the internal energy is held constant. And if the internal energy is held constant, we can rewrite this equation where heat added equals work done. That's the important thing. That's the second time that's happened. Someone walks in. I explain that I don't know something. They walk out. <laughs> I totally believe it. <laughs> what happened? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Has he? Dude, I'm going to be a legend on campus by the end of this year. Mark my words. I'm going to walk around and people are just going to be throwing stones at me. Like, Fuck you, man. I don't want to study for the MCAT. <laughs> so the delta U is equal to zero, right? And if that equals zero, that means we can rearrange the Q and the W to get Q equals W. What does that mean? It means that every sing and this is the easiest way to understand this. Every single ounce of energy that you're putting in, every single ounce of heat that you're putting into the system goes towards doing work, right? Every ounce of, it's not wasted. There's not a single amount of waste because if there were, the temperature would be going up, right? The temperature of the system would be increasing. But since it's not taking any of that energy and giving it to the surrounding environment of the system, the temperature stays the same and all of the work is done using the energy you put in. In an adiabatic process, Q equals zero. So the heat added or the heat removed is equal to zero, which means that the change in internal energy of the system is completely dependent upon the amount of work done. How does that work? I don't fucking know. I have no idea. But just know that that's true. Would you like me to write a little larger? Oh, okay, okay, okay. Huh? Is it negative W? Yeah, because work done by the system will reduce the energy because you need energy to do work. Isobaric processes are a little different. I will try to write larger. This is one where the pressure is held constant, but that doesn't alter the first law of thermodynamics. So for these, delta U is still equal to Q minus W.
and an isovolumetric process. is where there's no change in volume. And think of a bomb calorimeter. You guys know what a bomb calorimeter is, right? If there's no change in volume, there's no work done. So think of a piston almost, either a bomb calorimeter or a piston, right? When there's work done, the piston moves, changing the volume of the thing. So if there's no change in volume, there's no work done. Delta U equals Q. Forgot to write the rest. Why do I put a slash through my O's? Because this means oxygen. This is zero. And this is an angle measurement. And this is a standard deviation. And this is a circle. So, I'm not that artistic. <laughs> I wish. It's a delta V, right? Delta V, yeah, I know. Delta V and delta U, it's, it's confusing. So you can also say change in volume like this, change in volume. Oh, yeah, one more. Partial. Those two look strikingly alike. <laughs> Also, I do something really stupid, which I'm not going to do for you guys, but I do it for myself. If I ever put this next to something, you would think it's decrease in volume, right? No, that's slight decrease in volume. This is decrease in volume, and this is, incred this is high decrease in volume. And that's how I take notes. Do you guys remember what, I, what this means when I do that? Must be equal, because there's a dot on it. You guys know how to write if and only if? If with two Fs. If. Is that like an actual thing or just because? If is a real thing. IFF is a real thing. If you have the time your senior year, either through the mathematics department or through philosophy, take introductory formal logic. I didn't, but like I skimmed through the book. It's actually really interesting. OK, let's go back to th talking about thermodynamics and not how I take notes. What is a spontaneous process? Oh, we're, we're back to the things I'm good at, by the way. The, those were the things I'm bad at. Now we're getting back to the things I can actually talk about. What's a spontaneous process? Uh, it is thermodynamically favored. That is true. That's what we're looking for. This process occurs without outside input. It's like my mom called me last night. She's like, make sure you go to bed. I was like, I don't need anyone to tell me that. <laughs> and specifically here, I want you guys to put a little star next to this, because we're going to talk about it in the future. The change in Gibbs free energy or the delta G is less than zero. It's negative. The delta G is negative. OK. Now, spontaneous does not mean fast. And spontaneous does not mean that the reaction goes to completion. A lot of spontaneous reactions are equilibrium reactions. OK? but just that the forward is favorable and the reverse is unfavorable. Correct? OK. So that's our little peek into the future, right? Let's talk about states and state functions. OK. These are your state functions, and I need these in front of me.
So state functions, what they do is they are properties that describe the system in an equilibrium state, or whatever state you see it in, right? They include pressure, density, temperature, volume, enthalpy, internal energy, Gibbs free energy, and entropy. This one nobody understands. But you will. Hands up if you understand entropy. Notice I did not put my hand up. <laughs> we'll do our best. Pressure is P. Density looks like P. It is the Greek letter rho. Temperature is T. Volume is V. Enthalpy is capital H. What's lowercase h? Planck's constant. 6.626 times 10 to the negative, I believe it's 34, or 36. 34. Internal energy, like we talked about before, is U. Gibbs free energy is G. And entropy is S, capital S. What is lowercase s? Seconds. <laughs> Not that easy. When I'm under pressure and feeling dense, all I want to do is watch TV and get hugs. When I'm under pressure and feeling dense, I want to watch TV and get hugs. So you remember your state functions. Not that you would ever need to remember them like that. <laughs> Process functions are descriptions of the pathway from one state to another. They, are, they include work and heat, which is why the change in the internal energy of the system is displayed by work and heat. Standard conditions are used for measuring enthalpy, entropy, and Gibbs free energy. It is what are standard conditions? 298 Kelvin or 25 degrees Celsius. One atmosphere and one molar concentrations of everything. Not to be confused with standard temperature and pressure, which is 273 Kelvin and one atmosphere. Is there that much of a difference? Not really. Because 298 and 273 are not that far off. I round both of them up to 300, just for the sake of math. And one more thing. The stable form of a substance under standard conditions is known as the standard state of that substance. What is the standard state of hydrogen? Gas. What is the standard state of sodium chloride? Solid. What is the standard state of mercury? Liquid. What's the standard state of carbon? Solid, which is graphite or diamonds or coal, whatever it is. OK? Let's talk delta G, delta H, delta S. Oh, before that, phase diagrams. Okay, I hate the whole diagram they have over there, but let's just talk about this. So, solid, liquid, gas. Solid to liquid is melting. 
Liquid to solid is? Liquid to solid? Liquid to solid? Freezing. Guys, come on. You guys all have ice trays at home? Fuck. Liquid to gas? God damn! Guys, I've been studying kidneys all day and I'm doing better at this than you are. All right, gas to liquid? Condensation. Why is the water bottle sweating? <laughs> All right, these, these are a little more confusing. Gas to solid. Is it? Are you sure? Are you sure? It's the other way around. Sublimation is solid to gas. Deposition is gas to solid. Okay, who can name me a very, very common element that undergoes sublimation in front of us? Um, not idea, yeah. not that I know of. Bromine, I know, it gives off fumes at standard temperature and pressure. You, I think you said it, huh? I think you were like whispering it. I, I don't know if I'm reading your lips that well. Yeah, dry ice. Dry ice. It goes from a solid form and it gives off gas. Dry ice. Liquid CO2 does not exist in front of us. You need very special conditions in order to make liquid CO2. Good? One more thing that they bring up every now and again, usually in passages, not really in question stems, uh, triple points. It's basically like a very, very special um, condition of pressure and temperature where all three phases exist in equilibrium. If you guys have never seen that before, I urge you to look up a YouTube video of a triple point. I think it's the triple point of oxygen. It's a very famous video. And you can see it literally turning into a solid turning back into a liquid, boiling, and then turning back into a solid, and it just goes through all these phases. It's very cool. I wish someone would do that with my brain sometimes. Just like give it a hard reset. What's the difference between heat and temperature? So temperature is just that. Average kinetic energy. X bar means average, right? And it's related to enthalpy. Heat relates to the total energy of a substance, right? So let's say you have one gram of boiling water versus 1,000 grams of warm water. It's possible but that the 1,000 grams of warm water has more heat than one gram of boiling water. Why? Because there's a lot more of it, right? Because there's more energy contained inside of that sample than this. But what has the higher kinetic energy or the higher temperature? This guy, right? And we will talk about what we mean by average kinetic energy. Because let's say it's 72 degrees in this room, right? That says something only about the average kinetic energy inside this room. It's possible that, I guess we're talking about it now. So there's a bunch of molecules of air inside this room, nitrogen, oxygen, blah, blah, blah. Let's just say that air in and of itself was a molecule. And the molecules of air have a distribution that looks like this. And at this specific energy, this is the kinetic energy that we call 72 degrees. But it's possible that there's some molecules here that reflect a kinetic energy of like 40, and some of them that reflect a kinetic energy of like 100. But they all average together. And the thing is, since it has that higher kinetic energy, I made this joke with my roommate while walking to the gym one time in the freezing cold. 
And I was like, you know, there's probably one molecule in the air that's just zipping around at like uh, a, a kinetic energy that would have given us a thousand degrees Fahrenheit, right? It's just flying around all over the place. But it's insignificant. It's getting drowned out by all of that, right? So what happens when you increase the temperature of something? You basically take this curve and you shift it. And you shift it like this. And now you get the higher temperature, right? Because the average kinetic energy of all of them becomes higher. Does that make sense? Well, that's one thing from the next chapter out of the way. Woo! Okay. So we talked about temperature and we talked about heat, right? And Q, Q is basically heat, right? And now it's not a state function. It doesn't describe a, a single state of a system. It's a process function, something that happens over time, right? And I'm trying to describe this in the best way possible, but I'm just so bad at it. Like, I'm just so bad at describing what heat is. But basically, heat is a process function, not a state function. So we said that it, it exists at equilibrium rather than in any one given instance of the system, right? So objects are in thermal equilibrium when they reach a constant temperature, right? And that's that we've seen inside of like calorimetry. When we look at the temperature rise, then maybe fall back down, and when it when it rises to its top point and stops there, that is thermal equilibrium. It stops exchanging heat with blah 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 outside, inside blah blah blah, whatever. The only reason we bring this up is because the process of measuring transferred heat is something that you've been doing since eighth grade. Where the heat generated by a system is equal to the mass of the object multiplied by its specific heat times the change in temperature, which directly correlates the energy to the average kinetic energy of the system, or the average kinetic energy increase or decrease of the system. Does that make sense? Cool. So all this is displaying is the difference between temperature and heat. I'm going to skip over the description of the bomb calorimeter because we're just, it's basically just an isolated system. It's the closest we can get to an isolated system. So there's a constant, there's a constant pressure calorimeter and then a bomb calorimeter. The constant pressure calorimeter is constant pressure. The bomb calorimeter is constant volume. Yes? C is specific heat. Heat. Oh, you're asking about the difference between small Q and big Q, right? So Q, for some reason, they read this little side, of, side note that delta H is just Q at constant pressure. Basically the same thing. Because it's a transfer process, right? It's a process function. One more thing. You guys will recognize this diagram. Or this graph, I should say. You guys recognize the graph, right? Here's 0 degrees Celsius. Here's 100 degrees Celsius. This is the heating curve of water. And over here is a solid. Over here, it is a liquid. And over here, it is a gas. Yes, not plasma, gas, right? OK. What's happening here? The temperature is not going up, right? The temperature is not increasing. What is that? Yeah, so it's latent heat. And what does latent heat mean?
basically what it is, it's, let's go back to our descriptions of how molecules work. In a solid, molecules are packed up together like this, right? In a liquid, they're a little more spaced out. And in a gas, one of them could be over here, and one of them could be in fucking Myanmar, right? It could be all the way up there in British Columbia, Canada. Hypothetically speaking, of course, right? I was shadowing a neurosurgeon yesterday, and it was very funny. So they were talking about, uh, he was talking about a tumor and in one of his patients, and the patient was worried about losing their eyesight. He's like, don't worry, that tumor's like five light years away from the nerve. <laughs> so he's going to be fine. Um, basically what's happening is all of the heat that's entering into the system at this point is transferred into breaking those intermolecular forces and allowing for the phase change, right? And we can do specific math on that, where here we can use the delta H of fusion, and here we can use the delta H of vaporization. And they'll give you equations and units and things like that. It's not super important, right? So it's the heat that helps to break the intermolecular forces that hold the particles together. And once you're a gas, you're just you're gone. You're, all that energy is just going to go into boiling. They're like further separating the molecules of the gas, right? Taking them apart. So Q equals mass times latent heat, which is just that stuff. Does that make sense? Yes? They're not going to ask you much about this other than the fact that what's happening here, all the heat is going into separating those molecules, breaking those intermolecular forces, and creating the next phase. Next phase meaning solid to liquid, and then liquid to gas. Right. What has the highest entropy of the three? Why? We call that disorder. Disorder. Right, exactly. And what can we say about the entropy of the universe at any given time? The entropy of the universe is constantly increasing. So if entropy is decreasing somewhere, it has to be increasing by a greater amount somewhere else. Enthalpy is a state function. And change in enthalpy within a system is is what? Delta H. So delta H, like we said, is heat under constant pressure, right? So delta H is the change in system heat under Constant pressure. Does that make sense? The delta H of any reaction is the delta H of the products minus delta H reactants. Or the heat of the products minus the heat of the reactants, whatever you ask for. Delta H, H, blah, blah, blah. Basically, the final heat, the beginning heat, subtract them, you get delta H. A positive delta H, we call that an endothermic process. And a negative delta H is called a exothermic process. What's favorable? What's better? Exothermic. Exothermic is more thermodynamically favorable. We want the energy or the heat to go down as the reaction goes on, right? We would like it if we start up here and end down here for delta H. It's an 
exothermic process. Hess's law is important here. And it states that enthalpy changes are additive. If the total reaction looks like this, and you go between here and here, and here you have a delta H, and this is delta H1, delta H2, delta H3, that means that delta H equals delta H1 plus delta H2 plus delta H3. Why does this make our life easy? Because we can just use the steps of a reaction, each stepwise part of a reaction, to calculate delta H if we have calculations based on those steps. And also, if we had this, If we had a blank, we could use the finals and the ones we know to figure out the blank. Does that make sense? Yeah? One last thing. Another way of talking about the delta H of a reaction is to say that, that it's the sum of the delta H of the bonds broken minus the sum of the delta H of the bonds formed. Because bonds breaking releases energy, and bonds forming requires energy. We've spoken about ent enthalpy. Let's talk about entropy. So entropy is sort of that elusive subject that I don't fully understand. And you guys, some of you guys probably know it better than I do, to be completely honest. And that's not uncommon. I am simply a messenger. Oh, fantastic. It is inherently understood as dispersal of energetic molecules. Or more space for things to move around. The second law of thermodynamics states that delta S of the universe is always positive. That the entropy of the universe is always increasing. What do we mean by delta S is change in entropy. So the final entropy is greater than the initial, which means delta S is positive. OK? Or in my notation, must be greater than zero, right? And delta S is a state function, so its change can be tracked over the course of a reaction. How much entropy are you gaining or losing over the course of the reaction? Now, since delta S, positive, favors the second law of thermodynamics, do you think we want delta S to be positive or negative? We always want delta S to be positive. That's favorable, right? Unlike delta H, where we want it to be negative. Understanding those two concepts leads us, finally, 
to delta G, or the Gibbs free energy. G. It is a combination of three things. Enthalpy, temperature, and entropy. Movement toward equilibrium is associated with negative delta G. And that's called spontaneity. So spontaneity, or a spontaneous reaction, and a non-spontaneous reaction, Well, ha, has anyone ever like broken that down? Have you looked at that sort of statement and broken it down? Well, we know that when we say it's a combination of those, we know that the reaction, the, the equation we're talking about is delta G equals delta H minus T delta S. Well, if we want the delta G to be negative, we either need the delta H to be negative or the delta S to be very Positive. Why do we need the delta S to be positive? Because there's a negative term in front of it. And if the temperature is held constant, right, and we can't have negative temperature because it's in Kelvin, right? It only goes down to zero. If that temperature is held constant at, let's say, 290, 295, 298, right, we would need the S to be positive in order to make that a negative variable, a negative attribute, thus adding to the delta G, becoming more negative. So when delta G is negative, we see something like this, where this is the Gibbs free energy over time. We start here, we catch up, we come back down, and we bottom out. That's a spontaneous process. And if delta G is positive, we would get something like this. Much more difficult to do. Right? Where this is G over time. And if delta G is zero, it means both things are happening at once in equilibrium, right? Delta H equals T delta S. One thing you guys need to know is how to do this kind of in your head when you're given an example, right? So let's say that you're given an example like this. I'm going to make a chart right here. And I want you guys to write this chart down with me as well. Let's say the delta H is negative and the delta S is positive, correct? That's what we want. If the delta H is negative and the delta S is positive, everything's going to be negative on that side, correct? Yeah? And that means the delta G is negative. It means the reaction is spontaneous all the time, every time, without a doubt. If you flip that, if the delta H is positive, that's a problem. And if the delta S is negative, well, that negative will turn this into a plus. And if that's already positive, that means delta G is positive. This will be non-spontaneous. Every time, all the time, without a doubt. This is where it starts to get a little tricky. Let's say that your delta H is negative, and it's helping out your delta G, right? But your delta S is also negative. What now? You need a lower temperature. Why? All right. So let's do a little example here. OK? So let's say that the delta H is negative 100, right? 
minus t times negative 10. Or, sorry, you know what? 1,010, right? Negative 10. Well, delta g equals negative 1,000 plus 10t, right? At low temperatures, like 10, this is going to equal what? Negative 1,000 plus 100, which equals negative 900. Delta G is still negative. But at higher temperatures, like 100, delta G is going to be 0. And at even higher temperatures, delta G becomes positive. So if the delta S is negative, that's going to create this to be positive, And we need to keep that constant low. And the only way we can do that is by modifying what we can modify. We drop the temperature. So this is constant, or sorry, spontaneous at low temperature. Positive, positive, spontaneous at high temperature. You get questions like that all the time. All the goddamn time. That's why it's in red. You get questions like that all the time. Know that by heart, by just looking at something. If they tell you the delta H is positive and the delta S is positive, look at the equation and be like, all right, I get it. I understand what they're asking. The temperature needs to be high. Why? Because here the delta S is favorable. You want to beef up that favorability by multiplying by a high temperature. Here, the delta S is unfavorable. You want to silence it. You want to keep it quiet, right? Kind of trying to hide it behind the temperature. Does that make sense? Very good. One last thing. If the delta G is related to the favorability of a reaction, you can imagine that it's related to how much product is formed. And what did we talk about last time that has to do with how much product is formed? K. Another form of delta G known as the delta G standard, is equal to negative R, T, L, N, K. Why negative? Because look at this. If the K goes up, this becomes more negative, and that means it's a more favorable reaction. So standard, standard, that little standard symbol means that the reaction is just at perfect equilibrium. It's like those are the ideal circumstances. But in real life, when the reaction begins, we don't have standard conditions. So it changes. But most of the time, you can use this. Because usually when you're approximating science, you're using approximations, ideal situations. So everyone put your pens down and just watch me for a second. When you do non-standard calculations, it turns into something like this. And it's a similar it's a similar equation. Oops, sorry. It changes. You're going to be using that though. But what this shows us is that if the Q is greater than the K, and this fraction is greater than 1, when you take the log of something greater than 1, it's positive. So if the Q is greater than the K, then the delta G is positive. And if the Q is less than K, then the delta G is negative. Why is that important? 
Well, we talked last time about how if the Q is greater than the K, you have too much product, correct? Remember, because K is that at equilibrium, and Q is this at time t divided by a reactant at time t. And at time t, if the Q is greater than the K, we need to make less product and make more reactant, which is the reverse reaction. So the forward reaction is unfavorable. And if the Q is less than the K, then the delta G is negative, meaning we make more product and the forward reaction becomes favorable. However, you will not be asked about that all too often. What you, what you will be asked about is the connection between delta G and K, which is there. One more thing before we move forward, if you guys are looking into the future, if you guys are sort of talking about how the MCAT displays this equation to you, there is another equation. And this has to do with electrochem. At standard, yeah. And I believe this can be turned to standard as well. I believe. Don't take my word on that. I haven't looked over at electrochem yet. But what this allows you to do is equate these two. And oftentimes on the MCAT, you'll be working with something like this. What is R? It's a gas constant. Normally, they give it to you. And that is my very roundabout sort of three years removed from the MCAT description of thermodynamics. Two and a half years. Not that old. Any questions about anything I said? No? So we'll move on to the gas phase. Thank you for listening.